like the lesson last week that Pastor Scott started us out at Nehemiah? Had anybody heard the story of Nehemiah before? Bunch of you? No? Yes? Hey, let's start all over. Y'all, this is Participating Sunday. So when I say something, I expect something in response. I don't want to look like a bunch of people with dead looks on their faces. I'm what they call a hollaback preacher. I got a little bit of soul in me. I got a lot of Mexican in me. I didn't know if you knew that. So y'all better be careful, all right? So anyway, has anybody heard of the story of Nehemiah before? Didn't you love what Pastor Scott did? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you a brief overall what he talked about last, last week. It took him an hour. I'm going to do it in about three minutes. So I might want to teach him how he can shorten them. Never, never mind. Don't tell him I said that. But last week, we learned how we need to align with the Nehemiah spirit by walking in the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And then how we needed to rebuild with the present in mind, not the past. Do you remember the, the uh, example that Pastor Scott gave us about that, about how, you know, people, oh, Lord, I wish we'd just go back to the good old days where we just sing those great hymns, amazing grace and all that kind of stuff. And I want to tell you something about that. My own personal experience in life, it wasn't until I was 16 years old until I got to sit, that I got to live in a house that had air conditioning for the very first time. Those weren't good old days, people. I'm telling you something right now. Air conditioning is a good thing. I don't ever want to go back to the good old days where I had a fan in the window and had to just hope that I would get a breeze come upon me so I could cool down. So sometimes the past isn't the best thing to get into. Sometimes when we start all over, we need to, all the time, we need to be in the present. You know what I'm saying? We can't pull back on the things of the past. And, and so we need to, to have that mind out of the past. And it's not a matter of if you'll be restricted, resisted, but rather when you'll be resisted. Guys, in this life that we live today, it's not a matter when the enemy's going to come after you. He's going to. And so you got to be ready. You can't just be thinking, well, this is going to be easy peasy, because it's not. And we need to be repairers of the breaches. He talked about how these walls got broke down and there's breaches in it. And it resembles our life in many ways. It resembles the life of a broken marriage. And we, now we've got this big old gaping hole because we as men didn't stand before that gate and guard it. And do the things that we need to do to make sure the enemy can't come in. And get and breach down our wall. Or for other relationships that we have with our children. We didn't stand as parents and raise our children and pray for them and go before the throne of God so they wouldn't go out wandering. And it's time that we get before them, we become wall builders and stand in those breachers and become intercessors. Ezekiel 13.5 says, O people of Israel, these prophets of yours are like jackals digging in the ruins. They have done nothing to repair the breaks in the walls around the nation. They have not helped it stand firm in battle on the day of the Lord. Wall builders and intercessors need to identify the breach. We need to identify those areas in our life, man, that we've neglected. And we need to start rebuilding those areas. And once we do that, we need to stand in the gap. Say, stand in the gap. And once you stand in the gap, guys, I want to tell you something. We war in the spirit until the walls are finished. I love Pastor Scott's example of the, the guys are rebuilding the wall. They've got a trowel in one hand with the mortar, and they've got a sword in the other. And they keep on, they start laying that mortar down, sitting in a block, and all of a sudden, this enemy comes up and he goes, what? Guts them, flicks them off to the side, gets them off that sword, and keeps going, rebuilding the wall. And guys, that's a picture of us in our spiritual warfare. We have to keep doing what we're doing. We have to keep living life and we have to keep, and the enemy's going to come and he's not going to give us a warning. He's going to try to sideswipe us and we always have to be staying on alert and fighting in the spirit. And listen, we war until the wall's finished. We don't stop and take a five minute break. We war until it's finished. And he talked about there are three things that resistance does. Resistance determines resolve. That was the first thing he said. And the other one I love, resistance causes God's people to rally together. Do you know back in the Nehemiah times, it took them 52 days to rebuild that wall? Think about that for a second. 
52 days to build the, rebuild the wall and all the gates around the whole city of Jerusalem. Man, that's what you talk about coming together. I know I, used, I had three brothers growing up. And I'm going to tell you what, we'd beat the snot out of one another. And we'd call each other all kinds of names. But let somebody else call my brother something. See, that's the way we are supposed to be with God's people, man. We're supposed to rally together and no matter what we do. And when we do that, man, we can build some walls quick. 52 days to rebuild the whole walls of Jerusalem. And then finally, resistance builds faith. Man, I'll tell you what, when, when you see that you can do something together like that, it builds your faith. It just builds your faith. That's just a short overview, guys, of what Pastor talked about. Today, I'm going to be reading out of uh, Nehemiah 2, 17 through 18. It says, Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burned. Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem that we may no longer suffer derision, which simply means mockery or taunts. They were being taunted. And I told them of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also the words that the king had spoken to me. And they said, let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. How many of you know work is a good thing? You know, I know a lot of my, these youth nowadays, they think that work is a bad thing. That's bad for you. I promise you, it's a really good thing. It does a lot of great things for you. It builds character. Builds your bank account. That way you ain't got to live on mom and dad's bank account. I'm just saying. But anyway, work is a good thing. Today I'll be talking about practical ways we can start rebuilding our broken minds. You all know our minds is the battlefield. That's where it all starts. It starts there. It started there with Jesus. When he went out to the desert for 40 days being tempted, the enemy came after him. And he tempted him and he just, it was all in the mind. And all Jesus did, speak back to him in scripture and defeated him. But that's where our battle starts. It started in the mind with Jesus, and it starts in the mind with us as well. Real quick, I just want to go over who we are as human beings. You know God is the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Well, in Genesis, God talks about how let us make man in our image. Well, we are a triune people. There's three parts to us, body, soul, and spirit. Well, it's in the soul that we have our mind, will, and emotions. And this is the area that the enemy comes in and attacks us. And today I'm going to be talking about the mind. So in order to be able to fight against the enemy and build the wall that protects us, we have to clear the rubble. Let me hear somebody say, clear the rubble. That's what I'm talking about. I'd love the illustration of how we walk through our lives stumbling around in, in this this brokenness that we, that we have. We just stumble and we stumble for our broken marriages, our, our, our job loss, our drug abuse. And we go around and we pick up these pieces. That's our brokenness. And we take them on as our identity. People, our brokenness is not our identity. But that's what we do. We take those broken pieces of our life and make them our identity. Many times our walls start to break down at an early age in life. Maybe in your childhood you were molested. And now that abuse becomes a part of your identity. Or your parents got divorced. And now abandonment and blaming ourselves is a part of our identity. <laughs> what about lifelong addiction? And now your identity is, my name is blank and I'm an addict. Guys, that's not your identity. That's not who you are. That's not who you are. Or even the voice in your head that tells you that you will never be good enough or be enough. Man, that's not who you are. So we pick up another stone and we take it as our own and we walk through life stumbling over our failures, never getting past them. 
because of the lies that the enemy tells us. And we believe them because we don't know who we are in Christ and how to fight and claim the victory that Christ gave us on the cross. And it's ours. And I think many times, too, we say, there's too much rubble in my life. I, I, I can't do it. It's too much. We see all of our failures and all of our mistakes piled up and broken. It's how do I fix this? It's like eating an elephant. How do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. But see, they thought that as well. Some things just don't change. In Nehemiah 4.10 it says, In Judah it was said, The strength of those who bear the burdens is failing. It's too much rubble. By ourselves, we're not able to rebuild the wall. And how true that really is. Man, I know in my own life, I think I have to do everything myself. I think I have to, in ministry, I think I have to do it all. In, in my construction business on the side, I think I have to do it all. I, when I screw up my life, I think I have to do it all to fix it right. And when I don't treat my wife right and our marriage is failing, I feel like I have to fix it. But the only problem is I can't. And none of us can. None of us can get out here and rebuild our walls. Number one, that's not our job. It's God's. It's Christ. And he's the only one that can help us. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in me will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. Amen. See, it's Christ who works in us and with us to clear the rubble in our lives so we can rebuild the walls. So where do we start? Where do we start, man? We have to start somewhere. Well, in 2 Corinthians 10, 5, it says to take captive every thought, every thought, and make it obedient to Christ. We don't listen to the lies of the enemy. When a thought comes that we know is not from God or of God, we take it and we throw it at the foot of the cross where Jesus takes care of it. This last week, I was talking with Pastor David in the office, and he was telling me his friend, the way that he deals with these thoughts, because I'm going to tell you something, guys. We got some janky thoughts. Can I be real right now? Man, we got some thoughts that I guarantee you, you don't want anybody else to know you think. Is that true? I know I do. I don't want to be the only person here. Because if I am, I guess I'm at the wrong church. <laughs> I'm talking about some sick stuff sometimes. Man, I wish you'd just die. Anybody ever say that? Or, this is a good one the devil uses, especially in the church assembly. <laughs> Look at that old heifer over there raising her hands. You know she don't love the Lord like that. I know how she lives. Huh? Man, guys, we got to take captive those thoughts. That's not of God. That's of the devil, man. It's not of me. See, the enemy wants you to, he wants to convince you that those are your thoughts and that's the way that you think. And that's the biggest lie we fall into. So David, Pastor David's friend, what he does is he will physically take this thought and he'll grab it and he'll throw it down at the foot of the cross. Well, when I heard that, man, something welled up in my spirit. And I said, I got to do something about that. I got to have an illustration that we can all understand. So I went out to the mall yesterday. And I bought me this little monkey with purple eyes. <laughs> I tried to find something really mean and ugly and scary, and I couldn't find nothing. And this is all I could find. But he's going to resemble our evil thoughts. I know. Just get over it. It'll be all right. It's just an illustration. He's really not that evil. But it's got these big purple, man, they kind of look intimidating. But guys, let me tell you what happens. Hey, man, your wife ain't making you do tortillas no more. Look at that homegirl home girl over there. I bet she cook you some tortillas. You got to say, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. I guess if my grass ain't green enough, maybe I better put some water on it. Now you need to go to hell where you belong. Hey, Jesus, this thought right here, it's not of you and it's not of me. And it's trespassing. Do something with it. But let me tell you something. 
Just because you do that don't mean it doesn't stay away. That sucker pops right back up. Man, I'm telling you, homegirl can make some good tortillas, man. I said get back to the pit of hell where you belong. Or, hey, man, dude, you've been sober for six months. That's good. That's good, man. But you know what? You deserve a beer. You've done so good. It's hot out. You just worked hard. Can't you just see that sweat dripping off that can? Oh, it'd be so good. No, I'm a new creation in Christ. The old is dead. The new has begun. You need to go back to hell where that belongs. Home skillet, and then boom, full it to crawl the cross. And I'm telling you guys, it's... That simple, but, but that's what we need to do sometimes. Listen, the de- guys, I don't know if you know this, the devil hates your guts. No, he hates you so much that he wants you dead. He wants your family dead. He wants your mama dead. He wants your children dead. He wants everything that you touch to be dead. He hates your guts. He wants you to rot and burn in hell with him. That's real talk. And so many times I feel like in my own life, in our lives, we, we approach the enemy like, Oh, man, he's just tempting me. No, he's trying to destroy you. And this is a battle. And it all begins in our mind, and we have to start taking this seriously, or we'll see more people fall by the wayside. I can't tell you how many people that I see on Friday nights that are on fire for God, and the next thing you know, I don't know where they're at. They didn't secure their mind, man. That's where the battle's at. We've got to secure that mind. Matter of fact, see, when we do this, we think of things that are pure and righteous. We've got to quit thinking about the old stuff. And Paul tells us in Philippians 4 8, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Man, when we do these things, we will begin to clear the rubble in our lives to make room. To start rebuilding. But first, we got to clear it. We got to clear the, the rubble. So, stay, start rebuilding with me. No, start rebuilding. Thank you. Whew, you guys fell asleep on me. I guess I want to do a little better. <laughs> Nehemiah 2 20 says, I answered them by saying, The God of heaven will give us success. We, his servants, will start rebuilding. But as for you, you have no share in Jerusalem or any claim or historic right. As we start rebuilding, renewing our minds, I think it's important to understand that in Christ, we already have success. Guys, you're not working for success. You're not trying to earn it. You've already got it in Christ. And knowing that changes everything. It changes everything. When we approach rebuilding with success already established, there's nothing or no one that can get in our way and prevent us from Completing, rebuilding the wall. Nothing. There is nothing. Nada. And I'm going to tell you, as I was preparing for this lesson, what we do now as a staff, there's a preaching staff that we have and we meet. And so whoever is assigned to preach that particular week, like this week it was Sean and myself. So we, we have this meeting of what the outline was going to look like. And, um, and then we met on Monday afternoon went home, we were supposed to work on it and pray about it. Well, I started working on it and praying about it, and I came back, and Sean and I came back Tuesday, what's God telling you? And it was amazing. God was telling him that we need to talk about the gates around their Jerusalem that they rebuilt, and he told me the exact same thing. And then my wife was reading a book that talked about the gates around Jerusalem. So I said, okay, God, I will, I will talk about the gates around Jerusalem. <laughs> Because I think it's very obvious that you want us to talk about that. And what I found fascinating was the Israelites were building walls and the gates, the significance that these gates have in our lives today. And so we should have a map up here that shows the the city of Jerusalem and the gates that go around it. There it is. But the first gate that I want to talk about is located at the very north part of Jerusalem. And this gate was called the Sheep Gate. And the sheep gate was where they brought all the sheep and the lamb in for the sacrifices for the temple. And so the sheep gate then speaks to us of the cross. 
and the sacrifice that was made for our sins. It's the starting point for everything. But it was so crazy. If you read the rest of this chapter, the sheep gate is also mentioned at the very end once we have come full circle. That's because everything starts and finishes with Jesus' death on the cross. Is that not crazy? Man, that's not coincidence how that was. That was God designed. The second gate I want to talk about is the fish gate. For us, it speaks of evangelism. As, as we have been called to be fishers of men, it's a natural process, pr- progression in our Christian life that after seeing that Jesus died for our sins, we would want to tell others about it. I'm going to do a quick survey in here today. I want everybody to raise their hand that has been saved two years or less. Come on, raise your hands. I want everybody to see them. I want everybody else to look at these people that got their hands raised. They bring more to people in Christ than the rest of us combined. That's a sad statistic. What happened to us? Did we forget about our first love? Do you remember when you first got saved how excited you were? How, man, everything was fresh and brand new because you knew what God had saved you from. And it was exciting. You wanted everybody to know what what they could have. That this man, Jesus, died for you. That he could save you from the the hell that you were living in. From the misery of day-to-day life. That you couldn't quit drinking. You couldn't get that needle out of your arm. You, you couldn't quit divorcing every woman that you married. The first time things got rough, you ran. And I know for me, man, it was convicting. Man, have I gotten so far away from my first love? For what it felt like when I first received Christ? And man, I want to challenge us. Because I'm going to tell you something. I see somebody like Gene and, and Andrea over there, and I see new people that they bring every week. I'm like, man, when's the last time I brought somebody that wasn't my mother? And the only reason why she came was because I was preaching. That was this morning. She had to go to another church, hear my stepdad preach. But it's convicting to me, guys. We are called to be fishers of men and women. That's our job. And I'm going to tell you something. If if I have this disease that's going to kill me, and somebody came up and says, hey, man, I know how you can get cured, and I was cured, I'm telling the whole world. And yet here we had this disease of sin that was killing us, that was condemning us to the very pit of hell for eternity. I don't know. I want to be a better fisherman. Amen? The next gate that I want to talk to you about is the old gate. And this speaks to us of the old ways of truth. A young Christian having experienced the sheep gate and then the fish gate soon see the need for experiencing the old gate. This means learning the old ways of truth that never change. God's truth never changes. Too many Christians today want something new. The latest teachings, the latest experience that they can change the truth to make it acceptable for the way that they're living today. It's the truth, man. God, we don't want the truth sometimes. Because, see, I don't want to give that girl that I'm living with up. I sure don't want to marry her. So we can say these things, well, we're married in our hearts. I only drink on the weekends, man. (laughs) Man, I work hard all week long. Well, you get completely plastered and abuse your family. Man, the truth is the truth. It doesn't change. It's the same yesterday, today, and forever. I'm telling you, the truth that, we, that the world that we live in today, whatever is true today, is going to be different tomorrow. It changes with the time. God's truth never does. The next gate that I want to talk about is the valley gate. Now, if you'll notice, there's a long distance between the old gate and the valley gate. And that's because for a new Christian, the Lord allows a honeymoon period. Y'all, anybody married up in here remember that honeymoon period where everything was perfect? They couldn't do nothing wrong. Now they can't 
Your wife can't even brush her teeth right. You know what I'm saying? Can't even squeeze a toothpaste right. I mean, there's so many. I t- <laughs> I'm telling you what. Once that honeymoon period's over with, whoo! But there's that time, and God knows we need honeymoon periods, man, because we need to grow and we need to understand things. And, and so, this this period it teaches us, and and it's, it's his, his presence is strong in our life like never before. But sooner or later, the valley gate must come. How many of you know the valley must come? The valley gate speaks to us of humbling and trials. We are humbled. And we have many trials during those times. The valley type experience is used by the Lord for our personal growth. It's never easy in the valley. Never. But remember, nothing, and I mean nothing, grows on the mountaintop. It's barren. Nothing grows. But boy, howdy. Them valleys are lush, aren't they? They're lush. Man, I'm telling you. I love mountaintop experiences. I love them because I need them sometimes. Sometimes I'll come out of a valley and I need, God, I can't do this one more day. And he shoots me to the mountain and it's, woo-wee, praise you, Jesus, I love you. I can do this the rest of my life. But it's in that valley. See, it's in that valley when the real stuff starts to happen. There was a time in my life, got out of prison, started coming to Fountain Gate. It was the first encounter. We had a praise night that night. There was some stuff going on in my life, and I had this spirit of rejection over me. And I've never been so sad in my life of this rejection. And I can remember falling on my face over here. This had been a time of three months going through this valley. I was crying all the time. Thank God I worked for myself and by myself at the time. Because in the middle of the afternoon, I would go to a spare room in a house that I was working in and get on my face and cry like a baby. This spirit of rejection was so strong. And I'll never forget getting on my face and crying out to the God, I can't do this anymore. And it was through that encounter retreat that he gave me relief. And he set me free from that spirit of rejection. And he took me to that mountaintop. But can I tell you something? Sometimes I miss my valley. I miss my valley because that's when God was the closest to me than he ever has been. And it wasn't because he was keeping himself away from me. It's because I was pressing in harder than I ever had in my life. Because if I didn't, I was going to die. And I needed his presence. And I needed him to do something. And he needed to do it now. And guys, I'm going to tell you, sometimes these valleys are short valleys, and sometimes they are long. But embrace them. Embrace the valley. That's when he does his most work in you. That's when he takes all that junk that you've been struggling with, that you can't do nothing about, and he exposes it and gets it out. Embrace those valley times. Because after you embrace those valley times, that's when the most fruits will come in your life, and that's when you get to the next gate. Guess what it is? It's the dung gate. I don't think I need to elaborate on that anymore do I it's all that junk in our life man that we get just to dump at the gate this is where the rubbish is removed and this is what happens in our life valley experiences are used by the Lord to clear away the rubbish so the true faith refined by the fire can come forth and produce fruit clearing away the rubbish in our lives is never easy but the benefits of this experience Oh, sweet Jesus can be seen at the next gate, which brings us to the fountain gate. (laughs) Is that not amazing? I asked Pastor Scott why this church was called Fountain Gate. It's because of this right here. There was an elder that had read this story, and he brought it up and said, man, I think we need to change the name to Fountain Gate. Guys, let me tell you about Fountain Gate. People ask me why our Celebrate Recovery on Friday night is doing so well. And there is a revival on Friday nights, guys. And I'm, I'm not talking about, no, this, it's a sustained revival. 165 people were baptized last year. We are having baptisms weekly, lives saved weekly. It's, mo- it's one of the most powerful moments you'll ever see. This last Friday night, I can't describe the worship. And they asked me why. I said, because of the house that it's in. 
See, this house is a friend of the Holy Spirit. And it's the Holy Spirit that draws all men unto him. Listen, guys, we can create and we can, we can, we can have a place and create an atmosphere for people. But make no mistake about it, it's nothing that we do that draws people to Christ. It's the Holy Spirit. And when you're a friend of the Holy Spirit, you're going to see revival break out. And pastor is a friend of the Holy Spirit. And this house is a friend of the Holy Spirit. And that's why lives are being changed from the inside out. This gate is located extremely close to the dung gate. <laughs> I mean, it's like right next door. It's like one of them neighbors you, you want to move a little bit further away, you know. But that's so after a valley-type experience where rubbish in our life is cleared out through the dung gate, true faith comes forth and the fountains begin to flow quite quickly. Those fountains start flowing. This speaks to us of the living waters of the Holy Spirit that cleanses our lives and empowers us for our Christian life. John 3, John 7, 38 says, Whoever believes in me, as the scriptures have said, streams of living water will flow from within him. Man, that's a great promise. Streams of living water flows through me today to where it used to, it was sewage. But it's fresh and it's new every single morning today. The next gate we arrive at is the water gate. Yeah, I hear a little chuckle, some older people near. <laughs> the water gate, however, is a picture of the Word of God and its effect in our life. Psalm 119.9 says that it's only through God's Word that we can be clean. It's no coincidence that this gate was located next to the fountain gate, as the two often go together. The Holy Spirit is the one who makes the Word of God alive to us personally, allowing cleansing, encouragement, and direction to take place in our life. That is so amazing. I love that, man, that word, the word. It's what cleanses, man. It's, and what I love about the fountain gate, which is the Holy Spirit, is the fountain gate makes that word come alive. I experienced it this week studying Nehemiah. The word actually came alive into my life. It was moving. Man, it's crazy. It went from words on a page to actually life in me. That's what the Holy Spirit does with God's Word. The next gate we get to is the horse gate. And this speaks to us of warfare as, as horses were used in battle and became a symbol of war. Spiritual warfare is a requirement of every Christian because we are all in a battle, whether we know it or not. I'll tell you something right now, that's not a coincidence that your car broke down. It's not a coincidence that your husband left you. We are in a warfare. You remember when I told you how the enemy hates your guts? Man, that's war. We are in a warfare. And that the, this horse gate represents that warfare that we're in. It's also interesting that the horse gate follows the water or the word. For as the word goes forth, the spiritual warfare is sure to increase. Did you ever notice that? Man, you ain't living for the Lord, really. You're coming to church and you're going out with your buddies and getting drunk and you're living your life throughout the week Then you come to church again and you keep doing that and your life's going pretty good, really. But the first time that word comes from your mouth, I give my life to you, God, all hell breaks loose. It just does, man. The enemy comes after us and he hits us and he hits us hard. But that's all right, man. We're the war horses. Ezekiel 44, 1 through 3 says this about the east gate. This is the east gate's the next gate. The gate that looked towards the east, and it was shut. The Lord said to me, this gate shall be shut. It shall not be opened, and no one shall enter by it. For the Lord God of Israel has entered by it. The east gate opens and looks towards the Olive, Mount of Olives. And we know that when Jesus returns, he will return to this mount. Zechariah 14, 4 says he will enter Jerusalem by the east gate. The east gate then speaks of the return of Jesus Christ. For our Christian life, it shows us of our need to live with this hope and to long for his return. A specific crown is given to those who do this. Y'all ready for his return? Man, I look forward to it daily. Daily, man. Like, sweet Jesus, hurry up, man. 
Am I doing something I need to do better that'll, that'll kind of speed it up? Just let me know. <laughs> and then the final gate is this, the inspection gate. This gate speaks to us of the examination of our lives by the Lord. This occurs in the, li- occurs in the life as indicated by Paul in 1 Corinthians 4.4. 4. My conscience is clear, but that doesn't prove I'm right. It is the Lord. Whoop. It is the Lord himself who will examine me and decide. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. Our lives are inspected appropriately. In our Christian walk, we should be living with this in mind. We are called to live our lives with eternity in view, caring more for the things of eternity than temporal that we see around us. As we rebuild the gates of our life that have been destroyed through our own neglect or by no fault of ours, we must, as it says in Romans 12 too, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. And how we do that is being careful what we allow our eyes to see, what we listen to, and who we hang around with. Man, this world that we live in today, it is so easy to get on our phone and go places that you never intended to go and stay longer than you ever wanted to stay. I know that to be true personally in my own life. Even the music that we listen to has a huge impact on our attitude. I'm going to tell you something right now. You can't listen to ACDC Highway to Hell and have the same attitude as I lift you high. You can't do it, man. And I'm telling you, it's, it's that simple sometimes. It's what we put our eyes to and our ears to. If we're ever going to renew this crazy mind of ours, we have to be careful what we put our eyes and our ears to. And it's also been said, show me who your friends are, and I'll tell you who you are. Man, I'm telling you, in the life of recovery, there's some things they tell you to do. Change people, places, and things. Man, if you don't, you're going you're to get the same result you've always got. You just are, man. This, this isn't rocket science. We transform our minds by getting in the water gate and digging in the Word of God and letting that wash over us and wash over your mind so you can discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will is. And the last thing that I want to talk to, talk to you about is Christ revealed. As we are being transformed into who we were created to be, Christ is revealed in us and through us. We no longer walk around carrying an identity from our brokenness. No, we walk in the identity that is ours in Christ. And as we are clearing the rubble, Christ is there with us, picking up, helping us pick up through what needs to be discarded and what he can use to make the walls stronger. See, in our rubble, we see failure, hurt, and disappointment. Christ sees opportunity to glorify our Father through our weakness. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, My grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. Man, this, guys, I'm going to tell you something. Some of y'all might get tired of hearing it. I don't give a crap. I mean, crud. It's my weakness. That word's my weakness. My wife says, if, if Charlie ever says that word, I'm hitting you. Just know what happened. (laughs) Guys, I'm going to tell you something. I can boast today about my weakness because it brings glory to my Father. I can boast when I get up here on Friday night and say, my name is Dennis, and I'm a grateful believer in Jesus Christ who used to struggle with chemicals and alcohol. I can boast about that because it was in that weakness that God is using me. I can boast that it says that I was a no-good bank robber, 20-time felony jerk. Because I can boast about that because what Christ has done in me. Guys, let me tell you something. The pastor of this house gave me his house this weekend. Gave me a platform. Not because of who Dennis Chapel is, but be what Christ has done in him and through him. 
And I'm going to tell you, we can boast about those things. And you don't have to be a no good bank robber to boast. Everybody in here has got something to boast about what Christ has done in them and through them. And man, when we get that, whew, we can do some fishing. Man, we're going to get some largemouth bass with that. You see, he sees that past was a, he sees our past. Everything that was our past, he seizes it and uses it. So when we start rebuilding our walls and we got all this rumble and stuff and we say, God, I don't know what to do. It's too much. It's too high. It's all junk to me. He goes, no. No, it's not. So let me tell you. See, he sees that abuse and he uses that so you can love others. And he takes that abuse and he puts that in the wall. No, that's going to be good. I'm going to use that one. And he goes over all this other junk. Then he sees that abandonment. And he uses that to give you belonging. You've got purpose now. And so he takes that abandonment that used to plague you your whole life. And he goes, no, this is going to be good. We're going to set that right here. Because I'm going to send you somebody that's been abandoned. And I want you to share what I've done for, the, for you. I want you to share that. Then he comes over, and he passes the rest up, and he sees that the past that was addiction, and he uses that to be a part of the wall so you can give strength and hope to somebody else that can't put the bottle down. And you can say, oh, brother, let me tell you, my God, he did it for me. He can do it for you. And so he takes that block, and he cleans it off, and he sets it in that wall. And so now my wall's getting stronger, and I'm getting stronger, and I've got purpose in my life. And then he takes that other block that's laying down there, that voice that says you'll never be good enough and you'll never be enough in this world. He said, oh, no, 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 my son. You will be enough because you're in me and I'm enough. There's nothing more that you need. And so he takes that block. Oh, and he takes it and he sets it in your wall. And now we've got a wall that's being completed. And he leaves all this other junk that has no purpose in our new wall, and he leaves it where it belongs. Has no part. It's not your identity. It's not who you are. You are a child of God that has been redeemed by the blood of Jesus Christ. And that's enough. You don't need any more. I get so sick and tired when I hear people on Friday night say, my name is so-and-so, I'm an addict. No, you're not. It's what you used to do. It's something you did. It doesn't define who you are today. That would be like me going around, you know, somebody going around and say, hey, my name is Joe and I'm an adulterer. What do you mean you're an adulterer? Well, years ago, I committed adultery. Come on, man, doesn't make any sense. You've been forgiven. Christ said as far as the east is from the west, there your sins are no more. And guys, when we get that and we understand that, Man, we can be the best fisherman there ever was. We got the best bait. It's Jesus Christ. The best bait there is out there. Would you all bow your heads and pray with me, please? Father, whew. Lord, I just feel this morning there's some, maybe some out here that has been picking up these broken pieces of their life, their whole life, and taking them on as their identity. And God, that's not who they are. They're so far from it. They're your children. We're your children. And Father, I just ask right now that you would just touch those people that need a new identity, that need to really, truly understand who they are in their mind, because that's the battlefield, Father. It's in our mind. So, God, I just ask that you would touch them. Father, there may, they may be some here that are struggling with all kinds of things in their life right now, whether it's addiction or a marriage that, that, that is broken, that needs you to come down and you to heal, or a child that is so far away from you, hope is almost lost. Father, we know in your Son that all things are possible through Christ. 
And so we just ask that you would just touch those this morning that are experiencing different things in their life right now that need you to show up. Father, that are in their valley, but they've come to that point, they need you to show up. Just let them know you're there. May your presence fill them today. And I don't want to pass this opportunity up, man. You may not know this, Jesus. He's an awesome, cool guy, man. Man, he, he, he loved us so much that even when we were his enemy, he died for us. And if you want to know him today, I want to give you that opportunity. So I want everybody to say this prayer with me. Jesus, thank you for loving me. Thank you for dying for me. Thank you that you rose on that third day for me, Father. And so your word tells me, if I confess with my mouth and I believe in my heart that Jesus is Lord, that I'll be saved. So I accept your salvation this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, guys, I just want to ask a real simple question. If this was the first time that you said that prayer, would you raise your hand? I have some information. Right over here, there's two people over here. Right back here in the back row over here. Come on, guys, right over here, right here. Come on, right here, Jim. Come on, give it up, guys. I want to tell you what the Word of God says. The Word of God says when one gives their life to the Lord, all of heaven rejoices. Man, we've had about four or five. Come on. Let's give it up to the Lord. Listen here. This is very important. I've got something I really need to get to you. Fill that orange card out. And when we get done here in a second, there's going to be an orange table back there that says this is your day because this is your day. This is the best decision that you'll ever make in your life. I'm telling you what, it's more than getting fire insurance. It's more than just not going to hell. Man, it's, it's about living an abundant life daily in our lives. Amen? So, guys, listen. I, I need you to get those cards filled out. Pastor Nathan will be at that orange table back there, and he's going to get you some information that's very, very important. All right, guys, come on. Let's give it up again for all those that gave their life to the Lord this morning. Would you all stand with me, please? Has it been a good day in God's house? Amen. Well, listen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Rock. Well, man, it was good to see all of you. Thank you for visiting us this morning. For your first-time visitors, there's a, a table out there. It's a blue table. It says VIP because you guys are very important. I want to speak with you. Bring your card with me. I got a special gift for you. All right? Okay, on the count of three, man, we're going to give a shout-out so loud of hallelujah, the heavens are going to open wide. Are you ready for that? On the count of three, ready? One, two, three.